So I think one of the things that comes out of any discussion like this, perhaps even implicitly, is all right, if these are some brain areas that in some way may be networked to mediate values, and these values are influenced by cognitions and emotions, and engage particular environments to then perhaps influence, affect, or even drive our behaviors, does that make us some form of neural automaton? What is the nature then of going from value to behavior? How much control do I as an individual have in this? Is this some neuroscientific twist on the old Ignatian maxim, give me a child when they're X numbers of years old and I will produce for you YZ? Does this simply mean, for example, give me a brain when it is a particularly vulnerable period of time and I can induce through mechanisms that engage genome and phenotype some form of endo and exophenotype that will do A, B, C, and D. Believe a certain thing, like a certain form of music, act in a certain way. And if, in fact, we recognize that brains really do control or are engaged in cognitions, emotions, and then ultimately may engage, act through, perhaps even direct or subserve behaviors, what does that mean for the individual who exists in the public society? How do we take that level of the biopsychosocial human and still relate those nature of public values, veridicality, virtue, vice, right, wrong, and law, in such a way that relies upon neuroscience and recognizes the nature of the brain, cognition, emotion, and behavior, but also recognizes a very simple fact that is fundamental to neuroscience. As a neuroscientist, I will tell you this fact. And it's a multifocal fact. Number one, we have an adage in neuroscience that says, see one brain, see one brain. And the issue is quite real. Your brain is a relational organ, as I'll explain to you later on when I have a chance to speak with you. What we know is that that brain literally grows up as a part of you. As such, it knows the interiority of you and your external environment, and is part of its job, so to speak, is to relate those two to each other and guide you throughout your meaningful experiences to sort of keep you out of trouble, more or less. But we also know that the C1 brain, C1 brain issue is reliant upon two other very important neuroscientific facts. Last time I checked, brains aren't just sitting at a dinner table making love with each other or making wars. They exist in an organism. Brains are embodied. Let's go one step further. Bodies are embedded in environments, societies, and cultures. How then do we embrace that construct of neuroscience to leverage what we know through our science and technology in such a way as to then influence the way we value our conduct, our behavior, ourselves, and our laws? Our next speaker is a longstanding colleague of the Potomac Institute, Dr. Bill Kaysbeer. After retiring from an illustrious career in the United States Air Force doing intelligence work, Dr. Kaysbeer is now a senior program manager at DARPA. That's the Defense Advanced Research Program Agency right across the street. Dr. Kaysbeer has a background in philosophy and cognitive neuroscience. Dr. Kaysbeer was also a doctoral student of the first family of neurophilosophy, both Patricia and Paul Churchland. And we had a very nice conversation last night about you, Bill. Of course, we had this in absentia. And what it basically came out is that Bill Casebeer walks on water. I said, well, we haven't seen him walk on water, but I know he can balance a DARPA budget pretty well, and that's even a better miracle. But one of the things I can definitely tell each and all of you is whether he walks on water, balances a DARPA budget, or works tremendous miracles through his first, second, and last book, he's certainly entertaining, and he's always on the point. Please welcome my next speaker, Dr. Bill Casebeer. Thanks very much for the uh, generous introduction, James. Uh, so uh, there's no way I can live up to that kind of setup. I'm not even going to try. Uh, I won't walk on any water. I won't even try to step in a puddle. Uh, instead, I will stay on dry land and talk to you a little bit about a wet object that exists on that dry land, namely this three-pound universe that sets inside of our skull, and how that three-pound universe might very well be the seat of the cognitive capacities that we bring to bear to help us make judgments about what we ought to do. And the reason that I think it's important to talk about this three-pound universe in that context uh, 
is because we have a long-standing problem in neurophilosophy. And the long-standing problem is this. How do we square our determinist account of the universe that our best sciences give us, our core physics, our core chemistry, our neurobiology, with the long-standing assumptions that inform our moral traditions about the importance of freedom in that universe? Especially given that being free agents seems to be a precondition, a precursor to being able to morally praise, morally blame, and otherwise reward and punish uh, people or agents. So what I'll do today is motivate for you a what I call a compatibilist position. This is a, a, almost a standard position, I would argue, in naturalistic interpretations of the will, where I will say that we don't have to run roughshod over several thousand years of thought about the relationship between will and responsibility because of determinism. Rather, we can appropriately modify our notions, our attributions of responsibility in light of findings from the neurosciences about how that three-pound universe helps us make decisions. So uh, in that sense, I'm going to say, uh, along with a uh, uh, Pat, I believe, that we ought to stop talking about free will in a robust sense. And instead, we should start talking about things like critical control capacities and how those capacities are embodied in the brain. And that if we do that, we will find that many questions about responsibility can be addressed using our best tools of scientific inquiry, ones that are deterministic in nature. So the subtitle of my talk is, How I Learned to Love Determinism But Still Respect Myself in the Morning. We don't have to get rid of our notion of uh, human rights and uh, respect for agents uh, merely because we think uh, that the sciences are our best tool for gaining understanding of our place in the universe. And I should note, of course, that these views are, uh, are mine alone, but that any, insofar as there's anything true, just, and beautiful in them, uh, it's because I have learned from reading the works of uh, theorists like Greg Burns or studying with uh, Patricia and Paul, who are truly giants in the field of, uh, of neuroethics. So what I'll do for you is I'll give you a potted history of the free will debate. Try to summarize a, a couple of hundred years of thought about the contours of the relationship between free will and responsibility. Then I will conduct a thought experiment with you to help motivate compatibilism, this idea that our attributions of responsibility are compatible with uh, scientific determinism. That will let me segue into a very brief, all too brief discussion of the neural mechanisms of control that groups like uh, Greg's are exploring. And I'll uh, dive in particular into the role of the anterior cingulate cortex in helping determine uh, judgment. And I'll offer you along the way some uh, 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 a summary of uh, work that actually both Pat and Paul have done about flushing out the nature of these control state spaces that might help us uh, uh, figure out attributions of responsibility. But then where I will end up is I'll take a slightly different turn. I will also argue that in addition to understanding how these control state spaces are embodied in the brain, in addition to doing that, we also need to understand how environmental influences interact with those state spaces to determine a behavior. And those environmental influences are often just as important as the neural machine machinery. And one of those environmental influences, I will argue, are stories and narratives, and hence the, the uh, plug for narratives in the title of my presentation. And I'll give you a quick two-minute summary of some neurobiological work taking place in that area. So what's the, the core of the problem? So the problem for free will. The problem is that uh, agency, which is uh, the term that we, of art that we use in philosophy to talk about the free will, seems like a necessary condition for moral responsibility. In other words, if I'm to hold Paul responsible for an action, then uh, that action uh, has to be taken uh, freely rather than uh, unfreely. And in a sense, we're morally responsible only for the former. So in other words, if uh, I choose, is the operative term, to, uh, in an ungentlemanly fashion, trip Patricia in, uh, on the way into the building this morning, and she falls over and hurts herself, I would be morally responsible for the outcomes of that uh, decision, and I could be taken to court, uh, and all kinds of things could be done to me socially as a result of that. Um, and protests uh, from me wouldn't help, normatively speaking. Now, on the other hand, if somebody uh, slipped into the coffee that I was having today, um, a drug, uh, you know, let's say some, uh, some LSD, such that I started to experience hallucinations during 
uh, James's uh, introductory remarks, and I reach over and uh, trip Pat, uh, then we would think of my action very differently. The latter action is, is, was not free. Uh, it was not conditioned by this necessary notion of freedom that undergirds our notion of agency. And you would treat me very differently in that case. You would say, I'm going to find that snake that put the LSD in that coffee and we're going to hold him or her responsible. So in one prominent strain of the moral tradition, agency just means to be a free and also crucially a reasonable being. So the exemplar here is Immanuel Kant. Uh, in multiple volumes that he published in the late 1700s that are really uh, a cornerstone of the deontic moral tradition that Greg has already explained uh, quite well to you. So here's the root of the problem then. The deterministic assumptions that undergird neuroscience, a lot of those correlations, for instance, uh, that Dr. Burns was showing you, and indeed the deterministic assumptions that undergird a lot of scientific work in general, F equals MA, right? seem incompatible with the existence of an uncaused cause, this thing called the free will that exists independent of physical law, or uh, as Kant talks about it, this thing called pure reason, a rationality that is unconditioned by the, uh, the mechanism in which it is embodied. Um, so the, the, the language that Kant would actually use to talk about this is he would say that the will exists in the realm of the noumena, not in the realm of the phenomena. So we had this noumenal free will uh, that we have access to directly that doesn't seem to be conditioned or bound by in any morally salient sense of the laws of physics. So there's the problem. Science itself undermines the framework that some smart people, like Immanuel Kant, think is necessary to treat people as moral agents. So we literally, because of the findings in the last 100 years, real, arguably ever since we discovered uh, the neuron, uh, the synaptic cleft, uh, and the work that has uh, proceeded in the wake of those discoveries, we literally cannot respect ourselves any longer, given that respect is intimately tied up to this notion of agency. So this is a problem. Uh, and some would argue that, that this is tantamount to the heat death of the universe for our moral concepts. This is a great leveler. Uh, and in fact, as a result of these findings, some argue, we need to eliminate entirely moral discourse and move just to a therapeutic model or a medical model, perhaps, when we think about uh, moral agency. And this isn't merely an academic matter. I mean, I, I try to be a point head to academic sometimes and, uh, you know, read the journal articles and the deeply analytic tradition. Uh, it's not just an academic matter. Uh, our law has assumptions built into it about agency. Our social norms are shot through with attributions of responsibility that link up to the notion of personal judgment. The way the folk talk about it, the concepts we use, are, are shot through with some of these Kantian assumptions. Our bureaucracy is governing the use of force, right? Whom we think we can kill in the battlefield, for instance, uh, are bound around uh, the nut of this problem. Uh, and the neuroethics literature itself explores this in its upshot. So, uh, so this problem has significant social upshot. And grappling with it intelligently may very well lead to changes uh, in the way that all of these structures and institutions grapple with it. So is there any way we can resolve this problem in a way that respects at least some of our moral intuitions but that also takes the sciences seriously. Well, some responses are to uh, go in one direction or the other with regards to that resolution. You could just retreat to supernaturalism, right? You could argue that uh, determinism is false. There is such a thing as a noumenally free will. Uh, Thomas Aquinas' uncaused cause, right, comes to mind here in the Catholic theology, or I already mentioned Kant's an entity that is not bound by deterministic laws. And there are some contemporary philosophers who make this move, uh, like Van Inwagen or Derek Paraboom, uh, Keynes' libertarianism, so strong libertarianism about the will, just says uh, determinism about the will is false and there is a noumenal free will that isn't conditioned by physics. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time arguing for this position, but I think that retreat to supernaturalism is not a plausible alternative. Um, and the reason why I think that is, is because it forces us to restart our computers. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right, that's good. I appreciate that. Yeah, that would have been a bad hook. Get off the stage. We're restarting now, buddy. So I, I don't think this is a plausible, a plausible move um, because it would cause us to essentially throw into the gutter a lot of uh, the sciences, 
uh, from the last 300 years, 400 years, arguably since Newton, that have been extremely successful in allowing us to make forecasts about the future state of systems in multiple domains. So even just on purely inductive grounds, right, I think there's a reason to uh, uh, reject this position. So the retreat to supernaturalism is one possible response. We're at least engaged in an intellect, the intellectual activity today of saying, let's, let's not go down that course. On the other hand, we could go in the other direction and embrace incompatibilism. This is sometimes called the biting the bullet response. Right? And there was, in fact, a, uh, a different issue of the proceedings of the Royal Society B from a few years ago where various theorists take this position. Uh, Josh Green, for instance, says we should just bite the bullet. Uh, and again, to speak strongly, and this is a little bit of an overcharacterization, but it's, it's fun to use this language. Our battery's failing now. We need to, this position says we need to ditch the entire infrastructure of moral responsibility. We just need to, to, to get rid of it, that it's not useful, that it's misled us. Uh, and an early exemplar of this is somebody like a B.F. Skinner, right, who writes in Beyond Freedom and Dignity that if we just take behaviorism seriously, we can get over uh, this medieval hangover we have about, uh, about attributions of responsibility. And there may very well be some truth in that. The position that I'll ultimately take is, is one of the middle ground where we may have to appropriately modify some of our notions of responsibility in light of the science. Uh, there are contemporary exemplars, uh, so uh, folks who are still alive, like Gil Harmon. Uh, for instance, he says that findings from social psychology about the fundamental attribution error, which is the discovery that uh, one of the causal factors that loads heavily on predicting our behavior are environmental factors, external factors, not just in internal factors. Um, he says, actually, that these findings about the fundamental attribution error, and the fundamental error is that we, we generally tend to uh, download causal responsibility to internal causes when it's actually smeared across the ecosystem, and that's, that's the fundamental attribution error. Uh, Harmon actually says that uh, the fundamental attribution error, its existence demonstrates there can be no such thing as character development, for instance. This character doesn't matter uh, for what kind of actions we take. Um, I also think this is problematic. Um, these bite the bullet responses are, are too quick. Uh, they're too quick in some cases because I argue elsewhere that they actually overinterpret the science. So uh, Steve Samuels and I have an article where we go about uh, rebutting uh, some of Harmon's assumptions about the fundamental attribution error. And it's also uh, impractical, I believe. So uh, I think that there is good reason uh, to, of course, use the medical model, if you will, bite the bullet. Uh, but that also the language of praise and blame, for practical reasons, still does play a role in helping shape this organ uh, that we know uh, is responsible for deterministically guiding our behavior. So for that reason, I want to then spend the remainder of my talk considering uh, compatibilism, so which is the middle way. So here's a, compotted hist a potted history of compatibilism. It says, hey, determinism is true. And I know that I haven't given you a, thir a, uh, a rigorous definition of determinism. We can talk about that later. But uh, you know, again, F equals MA will work for right now. But our moral concepts of responsibility are still useful when framed appropriately. And I think the most plausible version of compatibilism on offer attempts to take questions like, was my action free, this numinal freedom I talked about earlier, and reduces them to questions about control. Was I in control of my action, or was my action out of control? And there is a, a long tradition here of compatibilism, probably Aristotle as a compatibilist. Uh, he didn't use this language, since this is a term of art from analytic philosophy that wasn't around 2,300 years ago. But he does spend a lot of time talking about the functional architecture of the well-ordered psyche, which I think is essentially a, a form of compatibilism. And definitely contemporary exemplars like Pat are compatibilists. So, uh, in fact, a couple of the slides that I'll show you in a few minutes are, are lifted part and parcel from a great piece that uh, Dr. Churchill published in a volume that Judy Illis edited and that also formed the core of uh, uh, Dr. Churchill's uh, uh, groundbreaking book, uh, Brainwise. So the, talking about this control distinction becomes important. It will enable us to motivate treating agency questions as questions of control, which I will argue we can deal with reductively in the way that a lot of good sciences uh, do. And that we'll be able to demonstrate our compatibility with neurodeterminized scientific determinism by assaying some of the neural mechanisms of capacities related to control and see, see how those might common sensibly connect up to questions of attributions of responsibility. So in a sense, this is an exercise in reduction. Uh, so this is a diagram that, uh, uh, that Paul Churchill used whenever uh, he taught uh, a graduate seminar on theories of reduction. 
Uh, there they were talking about the larger issues in philosophy of mind, but I think the similar kind of diagram applies uh, for uh, the notion of uh, agency. So in general, when you try to reduce one phenomenon to another, you have a couple of op options. Uh, you can determine that uh, the entity in question actually doesn't play any role in reductive discourse, that it has no theoretically feckin' role to play in the uh, political economy of your theory. Right? So, in other words, uh, entities like Flaudistan turned out to be eliminated in semi-complete science about physics. Uh, so, Flaudistan turned out not to exist, or if it did exist, uh, you know, in the debate that happened between Lavoisier and others, uh, it actually was a uh, oxygen, right? So it, maybe it creeps this way on the elimination retention spectrum. Uh, ether turned out not to exist. This thing that didn't move in the universe against that backgrounded all motion in the universe. The Michelson-Morley experiments uh, in the early uh, 20th century helped put the nail in the coffin of uh, the ether. So it was eliminated from our physics discourse, which has turned out not to exist. Right? So we, we don't talk about them any longer. Uh, we don't have trials where we attempt to determine if people are witches, uh, you know, where we then punish them. These things have been eliminated from our vocabulary. Maybe agency will go that way. That's the bite the bullet response. On the other hand, maybe we can retain the concept fully in our discourse. Uh, so for example, for many years the nature of heat was lost uh, to us scientifically. We just didn't know what heat was. Maybe it was an independent liquid that flowed. Turned out not to be, right? Heat is mean molecular kinetic energy. Uh, and closely related to that is the notion that we can reduce uh, the science of thermodynamics dynamics to the science of statistical mechanics, right? A, a clean reduction that enables to bring tools from both fields to bear on talking about the nature of heat so that in turn we could build really cool things like jet engines, for instance. Uh, genes, in a similar fashion. We didn't know what they were. We searched for many years for the material basis. We finally found a, at least a semi-reductive relationship between the notion of a gene and uh, deoxyribonucleic acid. And so it goes for things like dogs, although there is some professional debate in the literature about the reality of species as a concept that I won't go into now in philosophy of biology. But these were all essentially retained. Some other notions may fragment under examination. So uh, for several thousand years, we had the pre-scientific notion of fire. Um, and when you look closely, it turns out that these phenomena that we treated as unitary actually break up into many different domains when you reduce them. So uh, you know, when young Frankenstein in the Mel Brooks movie uh, says, points at the flame and says, oh, fire, right? He's actually talking about rapid oxidization, right? Uh, and if young Frankenstein were then to point up at the stars and go, oh, fire, burn, right? Uh, he would actually be talking about a thermonuclear reaction that uh, has a completely different physical basis than uh, the flame. And if young Frankenstein uh, were to uh, point at a lightning bug and say, oh, fire, burn, right? We quickly discover that in turn has a very different physiochemical basis than either the fire of a star or the fire of so this is a concept that upon reduction fragments that's still useful and even though we use the same uh, uh, folk term for it, uh, physicists use very different tools to study that phenomenon in the various reduced domains. So another way of thinking about this talk is, is I'm plumping for a reduction of agency for its retention uh, but some modification. So there'll be some fragmenting around the edges uh, but retention at the end of the day with the cognitive neurosciences. And in order to do that, I think we have to talk about meaningful control distinctions. So here I'm going to shamelessly uh, rip off Aaron Sloman, who about 20 years ago had a really nice discussion on a listserv. You remember those days when we had listservs uh, that you would subscribe to? Um, where he was plumping for a point in artificial intelligence about uh, control. And he had a very nice thought experiment. He said, compare two different uh, artificial critters that you're building. And look at one that has a large working memory and compare that to another critter that has a small working memory. Which of those critters uh, has more control? Either ceteris paribus or in, in radically different environments. He's going to say, well, it's the creature with the, the larger working memory. There are going to be facts that it will be able to discover and hold in that store so it can reason about them that the other critter won't. And depending on the bit rate for information that's flooding into you as you try to make a judgment, this critter may be uh, quickly overwhelmed and uh, be out of control, if you will, in that environment, and this critter won't. Compare a critter with short-term memory versus one with no memory, right? So think of the movie Memento, 
Um, same kind of uh, thing goes. How about compare a critter with long and short-term memory versus one with short-term memory? Well, this one have a greater span of control in more environments. And so it goes down this list. Uh, where on the left side, you can see entities that cognitive neuroscientists and psychologists are, are perfectly happy talking about, countenancing in their ontology, uh, exploring the relationships between them in a, uh, a deterministic fashion in ways that are on all fours with uh, the uh, best epistemic tools that science has to offer. So I think that we can argue that creatures that are agents in a sense that is uh, important for our social systems uh, below on the left side. And we can get into some very interesting ones very quickly, right? Compare a critter that is able to reason about the mental states of others uh, to one that can't. So uh, perhaps an individual uh, on the low end of the autistic spectrum may have a limited theory of mind. And there are instances where I would not hold that individual responsible for their actions because of their inability to make a judgment about the mental states of others. And those are shot through in moral judgments that we make because uh, determining intention is very important. And so in that case, I might use a medical model uh, to, uh, to uh, try to think of a way to uh, ameliorate that situation. Or consider um, uh, another uh, uh, item on this list. Think about... Uh, Critters that have afferent connections uh, that help them determine whether or not the future state of the world was uh, caused by their action versus ones that don't have the ability to copy those motor patterns back into a store and deal with them. So uh, that may sound very abstract, uh, but we can bring that down into a concrete fashion by thinking about eye movements. Right? So since philosophers like thought experiments, we can do one of these. Uh, right? Let's say there was an uh, earthquake, right? and so I... Uh, put my arm out to study myself from an earthquake, uh, uh, you know, in an almost reflex fashion, and that causes some damage to this podium, right? You might think of me uh, very differently than if I appeared to just punch the podium right now. You might say, oh, we're going to hold him responsible uh, for the damage he's done to that podium. And yet, we can think of circumstances where our ability or inability to factor in whether or not our eye movements cause the change in the visual scene in a way that an earthquake does, right? Uh, could influence our judgments of responsibility. So right now, you're, you're making saccades. You're moving your eyes, both uh, uh, unconsciously uh, and under conscious control, and yet you're not reaching out and grabbing the chair next to you as though the world were shifting around you. And that's in part because we have this neural infrastructure that lets us make afferent copies of those patterns of action and factor them into our interpretation of the world so that you, you don't come off balance. Now, on the other hand, there are more steps, cognitively speaking, between uh, kind of evolutionarily non-standard actions, such as reaching up and poking your eyeball, so that there, there is a different phenomenology associated with the appearance of the world. And it's possible to see how on um, the equivalent of the poking the eyeball scheme, where you're not uh, taking the motor action directly uh, that's uh, causing the movement, but rather in a, a longer chain of events that takes more time to process cognitively, uh, where we might be able to then uh, lay out a distinction that's, cru that's crucial for uh, attributions of responsibility in the earthquake case. So that's a, a cocky mamie example, but hopefully it brings home the point about afferent copies and how even a core capability like that can make a difference for attributions of responsibility in an organism. Now it may very well be then that we need to cluster these meaningful control distinctions into higher order concepts, right? So Aristotle in his corpus talks about knowing the good, choosing for, it for its own sake from a firm and unchanging state of character. And it may very well be that some of these group together so that in order to know what is good uh, on a functional account, in order to know what's going to help you flourish maximally, uh, you need to be able to have a multi-channel sensor suite that uh, engages in error detection and correction, uh, that models the world so you can reason counterfactually, uh, that it has an ability to adjust salience based on environmental cues and so on. Right? So some of these concepts then may aggregate these together. Uh, and in fact, a very useful way to think about aggregating them together might be to put them all together in uh, something like a state space that I'll talk about in a moment. So let me dive into a little bit more of the neuroscience behind some of these uh, critical control distinctions. I think one useful example is the activity of the anterior cingulate cortex, 
Um, and I was flabbergasted about uh, five years ago, whenever uh, work out of the Brown Lab uh, first came out, uh, to hear anterior cingulate cortex mentioned in the lead-off sentence of a national public radio uh, article. So I almost drove off the beltway. I was so shocked. Uh, it's probably the first time in history that's happened. Uh, and the, uh, the work that they were talking about was uh, Washington University's work, uh, where they had a very interesting experimental paradigm. This was kind of back in the early days of the exploration of the anterior cingulate, where they were able to use it uh, to help determine whether or not uh, it functioned as an error signal, if you will, for your brain. So uh, there is a, a, a rich uh, a body of literature that talks about reward prediction error um, in uh, dopaminergic uh, systems, for instance. And uh, this is one of those uh, areas that's innervated by some of these nonspecific neurotransmitter projection systems. And so uh, here's uh, some uh, uh, photos I've taken from that uh, Brown article uh, that show the location of the anterior cingulate um, and that show the setup. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but basically they uh, could... You, you had to tell whether or not a stimulus that was presented to you was pointing in a certain direction and then make a guess about whether it's going to point next. And they could, different, they could use differential activation and anterior singlet to help determine whether or not you would make an error with regards to the uh, button press that you made when the, the uh, uh, short delay condition was present. So anterior singlet is probably critically a proper functioning of that region and having it appropriately connected to others um, is probably an important part of us being able to modulate our behavior in a complex environment and hence would link up nicely to some of those critical control distinctions we talked about earlier. So as we go about aggregating these into something that's useful, uh, a control state space uh, might be a very important notion. So this is taken from, that, uh, from uh, Dr. Churson's article that uh, appeared in that Ellis volume that I mentioned earlier. Um, it may very well be that some of those uh, transmitter systems that operate in more gross levels, like the dopaminergic system or the serotonin system, are important axes in the state space, right? So if I uh, interfere with your ability uh, to, uh, to uh, process dopamine appropriately, uh, I can essentially induce Parkinson's disease in you, right? So that the dopamine value signal no longer operates as a salience cue to help you determine what's valuable in your environment. And when all actions appear equally valuable to you, uh, then you take no action, right? So your system defaults to being immobilized. So a lot of people think of Parkinson's disease as a, as a motor disease, but uh, really it's more appropriately thought of as a, as a, a rational freezing disease, if you will. Um, and so we go for these other state spaces. Uh, for example, uh, Greg mentioned earlier the uh, amygdala and the important role that it uh, takes in modulating uh, salience and in uh, fear, as often as how this is talked about, for example, in Liz Phelps' work. Um, and if you disrupt connections between some of these uh, limbic structures, like the amygdala, and areas that are more frontal that Dr. Burns also mentioned, you can quickly uh, generate dysfunction and lack of control. So this point was most famously argued by Tony DiMaggio and Descartes' error uh, very thoroughly, uh, using the uh, canonical case of Phineas Gage, right, the railroad foreman who took the tamping iron through orbitofrontal cortex disrupted some of this connectivity, and as a result, his gut intuitions could no longer tutor his higher faculties, and he made a lot of poor decisions after uh, that accident as a result. So the dopamine system that I mentioned earlier has a lot of very interesting connections to um, multiple brain regions, and it's also implicated in very interesting uh, dysfunctions. So uh, this actually is a diagram from Friedel uh, that highlighted uh, some of the dopaminergic pathways involved in borderline personality disorder. Uh, so again, we're starting to kind of push against the boundaries of that state space and say, uh, somebody who has dysfunctions in some of these areas innervated by the dopaminergic system uh, would fall outside of the control state space, and then we may no longer treat them as an agent and refer them for uh, judicial uh, treatment, but rather uh, we would treat them as a patient and refer them for uh, medical treatment, for instance. Now I'll pivot in the last few minutes, talk about how these internal factors relate to broader uh, factors in the environment that are also important determinants of behavior. Um, I've already talked to you about the fundamental attribution error research that points out that, uh, if you will, causal responsibility for any particular action is likely smeared across the organism and environment in interesting ways. Uh, so much so that perhaps in some environments, 
we might say that any control, any control system would have reasonably been overwhelmed, right? And in that case, we might not hold an individual in that environment responsible for their actions. You can probably think of all kinds of interesting scenarios where that would be. And I would argue that narratives are an important part of the environment that are often underserved in our literature, although I'm happy to report that there's now a, a rich and growing uh, body of neuroscientific work that tells us about the important, important role of narratives in influencing behavior. And if you think about this from an evolutionary psychological perspective, this makes a lot of sense. So think about the environment of adaptation in the Pleistocene. So, you know, 80,000 years ago, uh, when we were uh, hunters and gatherers, we spent a lot of time around campfires, uh, swapping stories, trading information about hunting routes, about trading about whom you could trust and whom you couldn't as you interacted with other bands. This was all done in an environment of safety and security, of warmth. Um, and this probably explains why narratives and stories themselves have these very interesting relations to uh, some of those volume transmission systems like the oxytocin production system in the brain. So, um, and why we uh, sometimes uh, find hearing them to be rewarding, this interesting connections to the dopaminergic system. Uh, and why they, hearing them may even result in structural changes in the brain in the long run. I think there will be some interesting work coming out of the academic pipeline in that area soon. So these can also serve as a bridge, if you will, from our rhetorical environment in which we evolved to that control state space. Um, and uh, there's lots of fascinating experimental work emerging here. Let me uh, talk about some of it for 10 or 15 seconds each. Uh, for instance, uh, David Eagleman's lab at the Baylor College of Medicine has been conducting work where they can deliver a narrative stimulus to an individual and reliably detect depressions in default empathy networks in the brain that occur as a result of you interacting with an outgroup member in that narrative. All right, so the setup of the experiment is this. Uh, you are a Justinian and an Augustinian. Uh, the Justinians are at war with the Augustinians, and you're a Justinian. Uh, then they'll put you in the scanner and present a hand with, a Justinian, uh, with an Augustinian symbol on it, and then they will have a hypodermic needle come down and puncture the hand, and that serves as a proxy for how empathetic you are with harm being done to that outgroup member, right? Uh, and the control conditions, a, a Q-tip comes down and uh, touches the hand. And so they get very interesting results where both traditional labels uh, that are religious in nature, uh, and random assignations of labels uh, results in a d depression of the default empathy network. So that's a fascinating finding. We, we, we have evolved to be storytelling and consuming creatures, so much so that even when I know my in-group assignation was arbitrary, it can't help but influence that default empathy network, even when I know it. So it's cognitively impenetrable in some cases. Um, so that's a very interesting work that uh, will likely be published and it's under peer review right now. Or look at work being done by Reed Montague's lab uh, at Virginia Tech. Uh, so Reed's uh, one of the pioneers in the exploration of the dopaminergic reward system. Uh, they have a very interesting experimental setup where they look at how nicotine addiction influences judgments about the future of a stock market. So they use empirical stock market traces and then ask individuals to make investment decisions. Uh, in that stock market, so I ought to put my money into the market because I think it's going to rise on the next time step uh, or go down, in which case I should draw down my money. And then they use fMRI scans uh, simultaneously to look at some of the reward processing mechanisms in the brain that are influenced as people make that decision. And they're doing this with subjects who are cigarette smokers. And here's the startling finding. Uh, when you look at reward prediction error in that system, it turns out that if you are a sated cigarette smoker, so you have your nicotine fix and you're now making these judgments, that the experimenter telling you you are about to receive some nicotine, this cigarette has nicotine in it, generates more reward than the amount of reward generated by a reception of the nicotine in the non-sated condition. Right? That's, that's a pretty stunning finding. Now, you may say, of course, we should expect this, right? We did the Coke and Pepsi experiments, right? We know that uh, what I tell you about something can influence how rewarding you find it to be, but now we're finally getting quantitative and uh, pregnant, if you will, to give birth to all kinds of interesting experiments that will help us explore the dimensions of that control state space that, uh, that Dr. Churchwin talked about. Um, 
Lots more interesting work taking place in the, on uh, narratives and uh, brain mechanisms responsible for control. Uh, the Zach lab, for instance, is starting to correlate uh, empathetic reactions to stories to endogenous oxytocin production in the brain. Uh, and we know that oxytocin is an important uh, social hormone, if you will, that lubricates uh, trust between individuals in the uh, experimental economics literature. Uh, so I, I won't dwell here any longer, given that I'm just about out of time, but I wanted to kind of footstop the very interesting growing body of neuroscience related to this environmental factor that interacts with that control state space in, a, in very interesting ways. So I would argue we have a very interesting research agenda ahead of us for the next uh, 100 years or so, that we need to co-evolve our medium granularity control concepts with cognitive neuroscience so that we generate a neuroscience of critical control distinctions. We need to work from the low-hanging fruit that already exists, the work that's been done in the last 10 or 15 years. Some of these distinctions are going to be social. I think of narratives, uh, given our evolutionary history, and hence, Tools that let us explore social interactions, especially in the neuroscience realm, are going to be very useful, like uh, hyperscanning, the methodology that lets us network together multiple fMRI machines to run uh, uh, social experiments uh, in, vivo, in vivo. So one place to start, then, is to look for systematic variations in the sensitivity to social cues that are related to brain function. So think back to uh, the salience of social norms, for instance. And I would argue that Dr. Burns' work, for instance, is actually uh, doing that for us. And then look for disorders in that three-axis control space. Uh, possibly expand the number of axes. Right? There are likely others that uh, will turn out to empirically be important for the notion of expanded control. And keep in mind the situational influences which will push agents into the borders of that space and ultimately make a medical model uh, versus a moral model appropriate for uh, ameliorating the situation. Um, so I think exciting times lie ahead for us in the field of neuroethics, and I look forward to discussing with you whether or not compatibilism about agency is an appropriate response to the findings from uh, the last 20 years. Thank you. I told you, right? <laughs> so we have time for about four questions from the audience, please. Thank you. Uh, with, re with regard to controls, uh, just two statements, and I like the, your perceptive reaction to it. Uh, in one area, uh, in, in space, where you were talking about the uh, space, there's semantic space. And in experimentation, uh, when the experimenter is talking to, to an experimental subject, uh, you're using denotative uh, meanings of words. Mm -hmm. However, the individuals, depending on their circumstances, their culture, and, and so forth, have a connotative right. meaning of that word. And if you put those meanings into a semantic space, uh, is, is that, it seems that that's another way of c controlling uh, the groups and, and maybe explaining some of the results ac according to where their perceptions are. Uh, I'll leave it at, at, at that. Yeah, I th that's a great comment. I, I agree. So there is a difference in philosophy of language between uh, the objects in an environment to which a word or concept applies and the meaning of that word or concept in the internal economy of the, uh, the critter doing the thinking, right? So denotation and connotation. And so it might very well be that cultural differences in how stories are received uh, turns not upon what parts of the story pick out what things in the environment, but rather how uh, the meaning of the story is interpreted in the internal milieu. And I'm, I fully agree. It's an empirical question as to how variable these core mechanisms that have evolved in evolutionary timescales are, are in light of cultural influence. So I see Dr. Burns' work, for instance, as being very important in helping us suss that out. It might be that there are limits uh, to how much any given social system can massage an internal milieu, right? So there are bounds of the state space that are uh, biologically determined. Um, and I would guess also that because we all confront similar problems socially, that, and by the way, I think this also explains why even though there is moral disagreement between cultures, there's also a whole lot of agreement, morally speaking, about norms. That because we're confronting similar uh, problems as a social species, that we will see similarities in the mechanisms that have evolved to help us deal with uh, uh, connotative disagreement, if you will. 
And actually, there's a, it's not ready for publication yet, but there's work in the pipeline at uh, multiple labs that examines this very issue, cultural variability in the face of a story stimulus in light of the neurobiological mechanism, but it's probably not going to be ready for the process for about another year. Um, to follow on what you, what you were just talking about with respect to cultural differences, it seems to me that uh, the research agenda should include also um, the same event seen with two interacting cultures. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind immediately is the front page story about the American soldier who's accused of uh, mass murder of 16 uh, Afghan civilians. Mm -hmm. uh, the person, the soldier has been removed from Afghanistan, but the story, the narrative, as you pointed out, that might be told about that event uh, from the perspective of control and responsibility and moral culpability uh, is very different for Americans, perhaps, than for Afghans. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Afghans had turned the man over to the families of the victims in uh, let them be him. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's, but we are in a political culture that is one in which uh, political cultures are interacting in the same space mm -hmm. over uh, the same ostensible objectives. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me that you, the research agenda ought to include um, events where uh, two interacting cultures are viewing and interacting over the same event. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and there's actually some work extant here uh, that's being accomplished by Rebecca Sachs's lab at MIT. So the Sachs lab explores uh, theory of mind related neural mechanisms in some detail. And uh, she has a, a postdoc in her lab, Emile Bruneau, who's actually applying the neurobiology of theory of mind to help us understand why some conflict resolution efforts succeed and why others fail. Uh, let me give you one, and, and you'll see why this is related to your question in a moment. Let me give you one kind of living example of that. For the last 50 years in sociology and anthropology, there's been a hypothesis called the contact theory. Right? And the contact theory hypothesis says uh, that if only we could bring groups together, they would come to understand each other more physically. Right? If they have physical contact with each other, they will come to understand each other more, and that this will uh, increase the likelihood that they'll use a peaceful method to resolve any uh, disagreements. Right, so that's the contact hypothesis. Um, it's a problematic hypothesis. The evidence for it is mixed uh, empirically. Um, and it turns out that if you actually go to the West Bank, for instance, and examine uh, relations between uh, Palestinian youth and Israeli youth, and uh, look at the neural differences between these youth after they go through contact hypotheses-driven programs, that there's a very interesting uh, peeling off of some of the theory of mind-related mechanisms, you actually see neurobiologically uh, less empathy for the outgroup after contact if there is not an expected follow-through on an action that could be interpreted as betrayal. Okay? So uh, the reason that the contact hypothesis has, has uh, uh, the lettuce has hung out of the sandwich some is because it hasn't parsed up the different kind of interactions that can occur post-contact uh, post appropriately. And if it did that, we might be able to say the contact hypothesis works in this circumstance, and we have to, in our conflict resolution programs, build in a mechanism that allows the individuals who had contact to keep in touch, and then we have to design an environment that encourages them not to break trust with each other. And that includes in the smallest ways, like sending an email saying, I'm sorry to hear about the attack in Ramallah last week. Right? When that doesn't happen, you actually get more antagonism between the two groups than if they had never had contact to begin with. And that's true neurobiologically. So talk to, to Dr. Bruno, and he can kind of walk you through that story in a very rich and fascinating way. Thanks, James. Thanks to everyone on the internet.